Okay, so I'll just um, I'll just do a quick, some quick introduction. So um, today's talk is going to be by Chris Brady of the University of Warwick. You should be able to see his his slides there. Um, just to say, one of the reasons I was very keen to to introduce this session is I'm in charge of the Archer training program and have been for the past six years, and this is actually the very last event in the Archer training program, um, completing 446.5 days of training over the past six years. So it's quite a momentous event for us. Um, it's also very good because one of the um, one of the aims of the Archer training program was for it not to be delivered purely by trainers, but but to give a to allow people who've done Archer work, particularly ECSE funded projects, to 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 share what they've done to other users. And that's one of the reasons we were keen to start doing online talks, which we hadn't done under previous services. So. Um, I'm very pleased that this is the um, that this that we're going to hear the outcome of some of the funded work on Archer. So I'll hand over now to um, to Chris to talk about his work on EIS EIS dash two. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, right, the thing says everyone can hear me, so I'm going to just assume that you can and start. So yes, I pronounce the name Ice two, uh, and it's a title says a general purpose high performance input deck and maths parser. I am a senior research software engineer and, uh, at the University of Warwick. And uh, this work, as David said, was funded under the ECSE program uh, of Archer, for which we're very grateful for them. We wouldn't really get the opportunity to do this sort of work otherwise. Uh, so ICE2 is a library that allows you to control a code from a structured text file using rich mathematical notation. I don't really recognize the names of any of the people who are participating, but if any of you come from a plasma physics background, um, you're familiar with the epoch particle in cell code, uh, and this is connected with that. In fact, that's where the name comes from. It's the epoch input system version two. Uh, specifically, it was funded under ECSE 1319 as part of a package of improvements for Epoch. We did rather more than just this. Um, but this bit turned out to be general purpose enough that we've uh, extended it a bit further as a completely general purpose library for a variety of general codes. Uh, so Epoch is an electromagnetic particle in cell simulation code, plasma physics. We wrote it a bit over 10 years ago. Uh, using Fortran 95, and pretty much right from the start of it, it had quite a sophisticated input system. And I'll show an example of it in a bit. Um, we moved to, to the newer Fortran 2003 standard fairly recently. That opens a lot of extra options with regard to what you can do with the language. It's a much, much more modern, much less restrictive language than Fortran 95. So PIC codes in general, work by solving Maxwell's equation on a grid, which is the cells, and then you have a set of particles that represent ions and electrons moving freely over that grid. Uh, these are massively parallel codes. They typically run on thousands to tens of thousands, occasionally hundreds of thousands of cores. Uh, last month, I just checked on Archer, the median job size for people running Epoch was 1,200 cores. So it really is a fair size parallel uh, code. So the input system uh, does actually have to provide quite a few different things. It has to be able to provide properties for fields on the grid, properties for boundaries, uh, properties for particles, and just specify mechanical parts of the code. So you have to be able to do quite a few different things through the input system. So any replacement for its existing input system needs to have good performance in parallel, which means very limited communications. In fact, the ICE2 library itself isn't an MPI library. It provides you with some tools that makes it fit well into an MPI environment, but it isn't MPI itself. Dynamic libraries on large parallel systems tend not to work very well. They uh, take a very long time to start and uh, all sorts of other technical problems. So we wanted not to have dynamic libraries. ICE2 is a static library. Um, and it has to work exactly the same as the existing deck parser because Epoch does have a lot of users around the world. And unless there's an advantage to changing how they work, they just wouldn't. Um, so what were the aims that we were trying to do? We were trying to make the input deck reading faster. 
more maintainable is always very important in any piece of software that's going to have a continued life you need to be able to maintain it we want to be able to extend it further and more importantly although the original one was quite specifically tied to an epoch a code written in fortran we didn't want to tie ourselves to fortran forever so what does epoch's deck look like well here's one section of it it's a block in this case specifying the properties of a laser and it's surrounded by a begin and an end marker and then you have a set of key value things in the middle uh, the boundary this is patched to the x min boundary of something it specifies an intensity in watts per centimeter squared a wavelength a temporal profile uh, which you'll notice is a function taking three parameters and an end time for that laser and if you actually run that through epoch you get something that looks like that which is uh, what you'd expect from that profile so <sighs> ICE2 itself is actually composed of two separate parts, as you might imagine, from that uh, deck that I showed you before. There's a deck parser that deals with those blocks and key value pairs, and there's a maths parser that deals with evaluating the mathematical expressions on the right-hand side. I didn't really show something that has a particularly complex expression on the right-hand side there, but that Gauss function is actually a function. It's genuinely a mathematical function. Um, also importantly you have to only trigger the maths parser when appropriate some of the keys in epochs deck really are strings and have to be handled as strings so the maths parser um, maths parsers fairly simple idea you want to convert a mathematical expression into a data structure that a computer can use to evaluate the expression uh, you technically have three parts to something like that. You have something that's uh, called a tokenizer or a lexer. You have a parser and you have an evaluator. So the tokenizer is not very interesting in a lot of senses, but it's actually one of the more annoying bits of one of these to write. So the term is tokenization or lexing occasionally. You want to convert an input string into tokens that describe the individual parts. So, for example, here we have two, which is a numerical literal. We have square root, which is a function. We have epsilon naught KB and QE, which are physical constants that are built into the code. We have background temp and background density that are user specified uh, constants. And we have asterisk slash and the caret operator as operators. So, exactly how we do this i'm not going to go into it's a bit dull there's a lot of stuff about splitting up based on classes of character and things um, but you do that you split it into those tokens and then the next step after that is parsing that converts the tokens into a form that you can execute and that uses quite a well-known famous algorithm called the shunting yard algorithm or dijkstra's shunting yard algorithm so Here's a rather simpler expression, sine 2 pi. So just briefly to show how the algorithm works on it. We come across sine, first of all, that's a function. So we can't do anything with a function at the moment. So it goes on to an intermediate stack. This is a stack in the sense of a data structure. Uh, you push something onto it, you pop something off it. Um, but the term stack comes up so much in this area that the, the things that you produce from a parser are often called stacks as well. And that's a term that ICE uses. So we put sign on the intermediate stack. The next thing we encounter is two. That's a number. We do immediately know how that works. So that goes onto the output stack. Asterisk, which is an operator. Again, we can't do anything immediately with it. So it goes onto the intermediate stack. Pi is a constant. We can immediately use it. It goes onto the output stack. We've now reached the end of our expression. And so we just push the things, you pop the things off the intermediate stack onto the output. So now reading that from the bottom up, you get two pi times sine, or putting some brackets in exactly the same expression you started with, but now basically written in reverse Polish notation or postfix notation. That doesn't sound like it's changed much. We've just changed from one way of writing maths to another way of writing maths. But actually, a computer can evaluate postfix really quite easily. All that you do is you start at the bottom and work your way up. And this is a third part, that evaluator. So the evaluator takes that stack, which is now an input rather than an output, and we start at the bottom. So we have two. That's just a number that goes straight onto the result stack. 
pi, that's a named constant, but I know exactly what its value is. It's 3.14, etc. So that goes straight onto the result stack. The asterisk operator is an operator. It has to have things to operate on. So it consumes two values from the result stack, calculates the answer, and pushes it onto the result stack. In this case, 6.28. Sign an op a function takes one result, takes one parameter and returns one result. So I take the 6.28 off the result, take the sign of it and push the answer on. And the result is of course zero because sine of 2 pi is zero. Uh, and now I get my answer just by looking at the result stack and taking the numbers off from the bottom up. In theory I could have an expression that left me with more than one uh, result value on the result stack and that's fine that's something that ice quite deliberately lets you deal with okay so that's a bit about the uh, underlying stuff but fortunately this isn't something that you as a user of ice would have to work with at all this is all hidden away by the ice 2 library but it is actually quite helpful to have seen that because it explains some of how this code works um, so how do you actually use ICE2. You know, if you're a programmer working with it, how would you use it rather than what does it do? Well, I'm not going to try and do a full tutorial of everything you can do. It's not a small library. It is documented as well. Um, but here's an example of using it in its simplest thing. This is, you'll notice, in Fortran. Uh, the library is written in Fortran. It is intended to work with other languages, and I'll describe that a bit later. But here it is in Fortran. The main thing is you create an object called an ice parser and then you get in a mathematical expression um, from the user using the read statement and I then call the evaluate method which returns one or more results through this allocatable array uh, up here. And then if I haven't returned an error code I can just print the results and there we go. I've eval successfully evaluated a mathematical expression. That doesn't do anything tremendously interesting, but right out of the box, that lets you evaluate mathematical expressions written in normal infix maths form right in the core of a Fortran code. So that ice parser object is the thing that does all the heavy lifting. Its evaluate method with a string contains a valid mathematical expression. And the result is an array containing all those values on that result stack that I showed. Um, so that does allow for evaluation of vector valued expressions as well as single values. That's both useful in general and also something we needed specifically for compatibility with how Epoch worked. Um, there is actually also another method called tokenize that produces one of those stacks that you can keep and reevaluate as many times as you want. Um, if there are errors in the expression, you get an error code return, but the errors are also represented in a textual form directly in the core of ICE2. Uh, so, for example, if I'd done sine of 10, 20, that's nonsense, and it tells me the wrong number of parameters was used in a function call. And in this case, from this very simple code, it tells me the error happened in line 1 at character at line 1 there, character position 1 is what that's telling me. Um, other errors are very similar, so if I use an unknown function here, Wibble, as far as I know, is not anything in any branch of mathematics. If it is, I apologize profusely to the mathematician I've just insulted. Um, but here I've tried to use the function Wibble, and it tells me line 1, character position 7 this time, there's an unknown value or function. Um, it also traps other slightly more subtle errors, so here I try and take the logarithm of a negative number. Given that ICE fundamentally works on real numbers, that is mathematically invalid, obviously. Um, you could create a modified version of the parser that works on complex numbers, and that's actually something that uh, we're looking to do in the future, but at the moment it's tied to real numbers, so that's mathematically invalid and reported as such. Um, those error messages are built into ICE2. There are no extra files that come with it that you need, but you can actually give it an external file for localization purposes. And if you have a Fortran compiler that supports Unicode fonts, uh, sorry, Unicode um, strings, then you can have Unicode in there. Uh, Fortran compilers aren't actually brilliantly supported for Unicode yet, but it's probably coming in the near future. Okay.
So what can actually go in to that parser? So there are all the things that are built in, which are a few physical constants, um, the basic mathematical operators and functions, a few other things, but you can add extra things of your own. Your code using ICE2 can tell it about other things. So obviously it has a concept of literals as well, which are just the numbers that a user types in in the expression. There are operators, both unary and binary. We don't have ternary operators at the moment. And at the moment in version one of ICE, there is no way to have um, a, an operator specified from the host code. That isn't a fundamental limitation. It was just difficult to design an interface to deal with precedence and associativity that wasn't so messy that people would get it wrong as often as they'd get it right. Uh, you can have constants which map a named value to a numerical constant. Uh, things like pi, for example, are implemented as constants, but you can specify your own. There are functions which take uh, one or more parameters and return a value. Optionally, you can tell them when you create them how many parameters you expect, and it's an error if you give the wrong number, as you saw there for sign. But equally, there is the concept of a variadic function, which takes an unknown number of parameters, and then when it tries to run, it can say, yes, I understand this number of parameters, or no, I don't. Uh, variables are names mapped to a function result like a function, but they don't take parameters. The main point of the difference between a variable and a constant is a constant literally is this name is always this value. A variable, there is a function that's called which says what the result should be this time. Uh, there is also the last of the sort of basic parser objects, things that are, we're calling functors, which are things that behave like a function in the deck. So they take a parameter, but they carry state with them. So this is basically the same concept as a, a functor in something like C++, but as applied to a, a maths parser. Uh, obviously, Fortran itself doesn't have functors. They're implemented in a, a slightly different way on the Fortran side. Okay, so how should we do it? Well, I think it's pretty simple. So this here is the routine for adding a constant. It's almost the same as a previous example you saw. Uh, but you now call the add constant method, give it a name, give it a value, and you trap an error code for return. And you can print errors in exactly the same way. Constants are very easy. Functions are a little more difficult. This is something to add the Cauchy distribution as a function. So you call the add function method. You uh, tell it what string in the deck it should go to. This here is a function that is called um, when you encounter that symbol in the deck. Again, an error code and an optional parameter for the number of expected parameters. Here are the three parameters that define the Cauchy distribution. So that Cauchy dist function itself has, to, of course, to have a standard uh, form. That's how it works. It's all based on function pointers behind the scenes. Um, but it's not too messy. The most interesting thing to note here about it in a lot of senses, you know, it says the number of parameters, the parameters it gets. Host parameters will come back to status code uh, is used to return status, but not error messages. And er code is used to return error messages. The most interesting thing is the fact that this is a bind C function in Fortran. So this is a Fortran C interoperable function. These functions can come from a C code, from a Fortran code. They can come from Python. They can come from Julia. It doesn't matter what language you want to work in. So long as they can go through the C ABI, they'll work in ICE. And then the rest of it is literally just an implementation of uh, the Cauchy distribution returning a value based on the parameters you're given. Okay, so functions and variables have the same getter function that you saw there for the Cauchy function. Obviously, variables take no parameters. Uh, variables may optionally be specified by giving a Fortran or C pointer so that um, rather than having to have a whole function just to return a value, you can just say, uh, go off and get the value stored in this pointer, you know, stored in the variable that this pointer points to. Um, not as elegant in Fortran as you'd like, obviously, because of Fortran rules on pointer targets. Uh, functors are implemented as Fortran types derived from the ICE functor type and implement exactly the same function as an operate method, but they have a this parameter at the first, which is of class, whatever your derived type is. A fairly standard Fortran object-oriented approach. So the interoperability. 
ICE2 is a Fortran library. Its main purpose is to work with the EPOC code, and it is very heavily based on some work that was done uh, associated with EPOC. Um, but pretty much everything that you can do through Fortran, there is a C interface as well. Uh, all the things that are objects in Fortran, the you know, type ICE parser becomes an integer handle in C because you can't freely pass objects uh, having methods between Fortran and C. Um, and pretty much all the things in this that have functions either use bind C functions right in the Fortran or where you can't come up with a good interface for both Fortran and C um, that's na you know, natural for both languages, there is a C option and there is a Fortran option. Uh, that's mostly in the deck parser, the maths parser for speed is all these bind C functions, whether you're coming from Fortran or C. Um, functors, obviously, they're a C++ thing, they're not a C thing, so if you're working in C, functors work by capturing a typeless pointer at the time you create them, and the getter function returns you that typeless pointer when you encounter the uh, functor uh, in a, an expression. The maths parser's interoperability interface is nearly complete. I will freely admit this library, while the Fortran side of it is now basically done, the C interoperability is not yet complete. That'll hopefully be done fairly soon over the next few months. Um, it's about 50% complete for the whole library, although not all of that 50% has currently been uploaded to the public release version of ICE2. So I mentioned briefly host parameters. Um, they're quite an important thing because what you generally don't want is a parser that's entirely context independent. One of the reasons you would want a parser library in your code is that you want to be able to specify some context. So in Epoch, for example, if the user specifies X in an expression in a deck, they don't want to have to worry about whether that's X for a particle or X for a boundary or X for a grid cell. You want the, the, um, the core code to sort that out for you. So you want to specify the context for what value a variable or function could have. And there's lots of ways of doing this uh, through ICE. But one of the ones that uh, we sort of recommend is this host parameters idea. And one of the reasons we recommend it is because since this involves parameters passed to functions, it is uh, basically re-entrant unless you write non-re-entrant code. And so uh, is well suited to work in a multi-threaded environment. So the host parameters are a C void pointer, so type C pointer in Fortran, void star in C, to anything you want. When you evaluate an expression, you hand it that pointer, and that's passed on to all of those evaluation functions as the expression is evaluated. Uh, so Epoch, for example, uses these host parameters to pass space and time information um, so that users don't have to worry about using the right one. So Here's an example. Uh, at the top, we have a Fortran bind C uh, type containing two reals, X and Y. We then have a function that returns the X from one of those host parameters. There is an associated one for Y, but it's exactly the same as X, except this line here does res equals dat percent Y rather than X. And then in the main code here, I just add the variable for x with the get x function and for y with the get y function. Uh, and then I get a mathematical expression from the user and I then loop over a 100 by 100 grid, uh, count fill the value of item percent y and item percent x based on where we are on that 100 by 100. I map it to 0, 1. And I then call the same evaluate uh, expression but passing this host parameters being that item, and I then write the output straight to a file. So uh, you can put in any function of x and y that you want, and it will be evaluated over that 0, 1 range. Here I've done sine x times 2 times pi times cos y times 4 times pi, loaded that up in um, the GNU data language package, plotted it, and there we go. I've got exactly the function that I expected.
Um, so that's host parameters. There are a couple of other advanced concepts for uh, these parsers, for what they can do. So one of the ones that's really crucial to Epoch, if you've ever used Epoch, are stack variables. These are variables that are created from a stack rather than a numerical value. Um, Epoch uses these to allow users to specify what are called constants, but actually aren't constants, um, because that's sort of the key thing about these stack variables. If any of the bits that make up the stack you produce from an expression um, have space or time variation so that a different host parameter would cause them to return a different result, that's maintained. Um, and you can store this and you can use it in another expression and it all just seamlessly works and everything retains its time dependence. So here's another block from Epoch's deck. I'm specifying a velocity, which is 5% of the speed of light, and I'm specifying a momentum here. And the important thing is that that momentum varies in space um, because of this x here in its defining expression. If I use p0 in another expression, that uh, will retain that spatial dependence. If it had a temporal dependence, it would maintain that as well. Uh, another thing are what are called emplaced functions. Those are a sort of generalization of stack variables. So there's another epoch example at the top. What I'm doing is I'm setting up a species of protons and I want them to have the same number density as the electron. So this here is an emplaced function. So it takes electron, which is a parameter, and it returns not just the value of the density, of the electron, but the actual function that defines the density of the electron. I haven't shown the definition of the, the electron density here, but um, whatever expression I gave for that, that's returned here with all its properties intact. Uh, these emplaced functions work much like normal functions, but with a slightly different uh, getter function. Um, the other important thing about them is because the emplacement happens when you specifically tell it to, it doesn't just happen automatically. You can actually uh, use this. So for example, you could have a stack that contains uh, x defining a position, and then you could take that stack and I could emplace it subject to everything being face-centered on the x-axis rather than everything being cell-centered. And from the one stack, I can produce new stacks with different staggers on the underlying spatial grid or anything similar. I have control about exactly how this emplacement happens and exactly when it happens. OK, pretty much the last bit of any kind of maths parser is how you simplify expressions to improve performance. This is uh, important in pretty much everything in computer programming. Um, but so far, I haven't talked about it here at all. So basically, the idea is that many of those tokens can be combined immediately. Some of them you have to keep because they change in response to some external data source. So all constants are simplifiable because they're a constant. Um, Functions and functors where all their parameters are simplifiable are simplifiable unless you explicitly tell ICE that they aren't, in which case they aren't, even if all their parameters are simplifiable. And variables are not simplifiable unless the developer overrides, because in general, why would you use a variable rather than a constant if uh, you could uh, just simplify it away? So the simplifier works through the fairly well-known principle of forming an abstract syntax tree and then pruning any branches that are simplifiable. Uh, a lot of other parsers actually use abstract syntax trees as the main way of storing their, their data, the things they evaluate. That's actually somewhat slower, um, but they are extremely powerful as a way of simplifying expressions. So just to give an example, here's that thing that I plotted the graph of earlier. And there's a graph of the syntax tree for that expression. So you have down here, you have 2 pi. Down here, you have 4 pi multiplied by x, multiplied by y, sine cos, multiply them together. Um, run that through the simplifier. There isn't much they can do because x and y are not simplifiable, and hence these multiplications aren't simplifiable, but that 2 pi can just be converted into a value, as can the 4 pi. 
the numbers written there are written to a finite precision. The actual conversion is done at full double precision by default. Um, so this is an example of what it's doing. It's not tremendously clever, but it does speed things up, particularly if you take a more complex example. You probably can't read this, doesn't really matter. This is a real expression from an epoch example deck. It sets up a distribution of uh, ion velocities. It's a ring, basically, in, um, in X, PX, PY space. It's a ring. Uh, so that's the raw expression that you get out without simplification. If you run the exact same thing through a simplifier, you get this. And this runs about 10 times faster than the first expression. So saying about faster, you then do come quite quickly to questions of performance. You cannot get the performance of native code out of this. This is essentially an interpreter. Um, performance is still quite good overall usually takes about 30 to 40 CPU cycles per stack element. So the general overall performance then is about one tenth the speed of a native scalar floating point code. Uh, to put that in perspective, if you have a Python interpreter embedded in your code running NumPy, that's about 20, this is about 25 times faster than the Python code uh, to evaluate the same expressions. I've tried that across several different machines, several compilers. I get that sort of performance improvement quite reliably. Uh, there is also another trick that ICE has available if you want to get even faster. These stacks are opaque objects. Your code, if it uses the ICE library, just evaluates those stacks to get a result. So you can bind a result function to a stack and get the answer a lot faster. If you write into your code a specific function to do a specific thing, you can just bind that function to a stack and then whenever that stack is evaluated that function is called and returns its results. So there is the overhead of one function pointer which on most of the machines I've tested with most of the compilers is around four to five CPU cycles. Um, there is future work that we've done some very early preliminary testing on which allows you to use lib LLVM to compile stack expressions to give close to native code speed but it does have some real disadvantages. Essentially, I can make all of the core of the code able to be compiled through libllvm very easily, but user-specified functions either have to be an external call uh, anyway, which is a large chunk of the overhead that's associated with it, uh, or you would have to write those host code specified functions in such a way they can, can be compiled to LLVM intermediate code. Uh, and compiled in, which isn't impossible, but that might mean that this isn't as useful as it at first sounds. Nonetheless, it's something we'd like to do in future. Okay, so a very brief bit on sort of advantages and disadvantages of this system before I move on and talk about the deck passing bit rather than the maths passing bit. So I think one of the advantages is this is a static library. It's in standards compliant Fortran 2003. Optionally, you can compile it under two standard 2000, Fortran 2008 standard, which gives a few advantages. It has no library dependencies itself of any type. So it's extremely easy to build on any platform. It's extremely easy to link to your code. It's a lot faster than a general purpose scripting language. Python isn't the fastest scripting language out there, but we are a, a lot faster than it and pretty much any other general purpose scripting language that I've uh, tested against. It's also rather easier to add to your code than Python is or even Lua, which is a thing that I always have as a go to if I want a nice, easy scripting language to add to a piece of software. Um, it has another advantage over those more general ones, which it gives users only the level of control that you want over your code. Your code is much more in control of how the evaluation happens, where it happens, what values things return at different points than would usually be the case if you were using something like Python to script your code. Um, another advantage which is substantial under certain circumstances is that the core of ICE2 has absolutely no side effects. It has nothing written into it that allows it to interact with a file system, except for loading files. It has nothing built into it that allows it to um, interact with the network at all. So you can safely move decks between machines. You can run a deck from somebody else without any concern about someone having 
put something in their script to delete what's their working directory, but is the name of the directory that's got all your important results in. Because unless your code actually implements destructive features through its input deck system, ICE won't allow anyone to accidentally do it because it doesn't have any capabilities like that. Of course, if you want to, you can implement them yourself. Uh, another advantage, BSD3 clause license. So you can use this in open and closed source software freely. So it really is intended to actually be shipped with your code. This is not something where uh, we would expect people to install it as standard on a computer as a library and then uh, you link against the system version. You just ship it with your code and your makefile calls, them, calls the makefile that comes with ICE. Uh, it really is intended for HPC workflow. Uh, it's a static library. Uh, it has features that allow you to easily load files only once, which I'll come to briefly, uh, and then scatter them out uh, through the MPI communication layer. Um, there's quite a lot of nice features in it, but because of the fact that Epoch is a, an HPC code, ICE uh, really is intended to fit in with that. So there are obviously a few disadvantages. The main ones is that it only supports real and string data types as parameters to uh, functions uh, and return values from expressions. Strings are currently a bit limited, although they might get a bit better, hopefully. Uh, the simplifier does at the moment have some limitations, although we are working on them. There are some cases where it doesn't simplify things that it could. Uh, it's actually mostly it works extremely well, but there are a few limitations. It is more restrictive than a scripting language if you want to give users the amount of power that a scripting language gives them. It's not intended to completely replace entire sort of simulation environments that are front ends to, um, to simulation uh, packages doesn't really work particularly well for that sort of thing, but equally much that sort of workflow doesn't really map onto large numbers of processes terribly well. Uh, and equally, it's brand new, so there's a limited ecosystem associated with it. Okay, so the second part of it is the deck parser. So quick thing, which everybody asks, why are they called decks? It's historical. Uh, the terminology comes from back in the days of punch cards. I'm I'm not even close to old enough to remember punch cards, but the terminology lives on. Um, so you had a deck of cards, and that's where the term comes from. There's no reason to particularly change it. It makes perfect sense, I think. Uh, and it's as good as term as anything. The idea is it's an input telling a program what to do without having to recompile the source code. That's all that I mean by an input deck. Uh, in ICE2, it is connected to the maths parser that I've described since you use it to process the input. So a bit of terminology. I'm going to talk about blocks, which are connections of collect collections of connected keys. Blocks can contain other blocks if you want them to. Uh, there is a concept of a type of a block, which is the definition of a block. You know, So in that example I showed from Epoch, you had a laser block. That is a type of block. Every block type has a unique ID number. There is also an instance of a block in the epoch deck. Every time you have a block that begins begin laser, end laser, you can have as many of them as you want. Each one of those is an instance. Each instance also has a unique ID that isn't related to the unique ID for the block type. Uh, keys are a named item associated with a value. A value is an input that the host code wants. Uh, definition, I'm going to come to, is a definition of the possible blocks and keys in a deck. There's something called an ice deck definition object that sets one of those up. And a pass is a term for when you run the deck parser over a deck. Quite often, you'll need to go over a deck multiple times. Uh, Epoch, again, as an example, uh, runs over the deck twice, the first time reading only those blocks and keys that are needed to know how much memory to allocate, and the second time actually allocating that memory. Uh, sorry, first time setting up the amount of memory, allocating the memory, and the second time through populating the values. Uh, right, a few other things. There is the root block, which is the block instance that all other blocks are defined in. Uh, there are parents, which are the unique IDs of the block instances that are parents of the current block instance. Um, doesn't really matter, but 
that's how it's done. And the last parent of a block is a block itself. This will make a bit more sense uh, later when I sort of show you what the functions associated with these look like. And connected with the idea of parents are parent kinds, that is the list of unique IDs of the types of block that are the parents of the current block instance. And again, the last parent kind is the kind of the block that you're currently working with. Okay, so here's that epoch block again, just so you can briefly see uh, what it looks like. You have a begin and an end marker, and you have keys and you have values. Okay, so one of the deliberate design decisions in ICE 2 was that you separate the definition of the structure of an input deck from an instantiation of a deck. So it's currently written to pass epoch style input decks, but I could just as easily write something to read JSON or YAML or XML or Windows INI file or anything. And for a code, that would just be a drop in replacement. So the idea is that the definition specifies action functions for when events occur. Um, this is the thing where unlike in the maths parser, uh, you have a natural interface for C, you have a different natural interface for Fortran, so they're separate. There's a C interface, there's a Fortran interface, they're entirely equivalent, you can use either, you can use both. Um, they have a well-defined order of operation and things like that, um, but they are separate. So for a block, you have the following action functions. You have init, which is when the first pass through a deck, you first encounter a block of a given type. You have a start pass function, which is when a block type is first encountered in a given pass. You have a start block function when a block instance is started. So this is when you actually encounter an actual block and any block in the deck. You have an end block when the instance ends you have an end pass when the pass ends and you encountered a block of this type. And you have a final block when you finished passing and you've encountered at least one block of this type anywhere in reading the deck. Keys have some other action functions. They have key value function, which gives you a string for both the key and the value. There's a key numeric value function, which gives you a string for the key and uses an ice parser object to calculate a numeric value for the value part. And there's a key stack function that gives you the key as a string and an ice stack object for the value. So you can keep evaluating that forever if you want to. Um, you do also have the option to give it a pointer, either a C or a Fortran pointer to an integer or real variable, or a rank one array of integer or real variables, and those will be filled automatically for you. Uh, and also there are any star, so any key value, any key stack versions attached to a block that allow you to handle a key uh, in general. So. Epoch type decks are passed through an ice text deck parser object, which loads the data from a file and processes it through a definition. Um, has the option to load data and store it to a character variable if you want, uh, which includes information on line numbers and files, etc., that are used for error reporting. So if you're running in an MPI environment, you can load all the data on rank zero, be casted out to all the other ranks, and uh, they then uh, just take that string, put it into their ice text deck parser object, and it all goes off and uh, runs in parallel and works in parallel without you having potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of processes competing for access to one file. So here's an example of doing that. Um, I have a definition object up here, and then I get its root block by initializing it. I add a block to the root block, I then add some keys to that. I then add a new block and add a key. And I've set up the key value functions here and here. Uh, they're basically uh, exactly the same for all of them. That would be unusual in a working code, but this is just a test example. And then when I've done that, I have an ice text deck parser object here that I initialize and I tell it to pass a given file. And then I do error reporting, much the same as before, but not quite here. Uh, so what do those functions look like? Well, they look like this. They have quite a lot of parameters passed into them, but uh, they're not actually as bad as all that. So this is the one, the, the function that uh, has text versions for both keys and values. 
So here's the key, the value, the pass number, and then this parent and parent kind. So you can tell the exact hierarchy of blocks that got you to where you are. That allows you to use functions for multiple blocks if you want, but still do different things depending on exactly how you got to where you did. Uh, status code and er code, again, return non-error statuses and errors. Uh, host state is something that's a bit specific. I'm not particularly going to mention it, but it's a way of allowing you to return other numerical information from inside these things and is something that Epoch uses in particular. Um, this one basically just checks, is there a double quote in the string? If there is, it's a string and I want it. Um, this has actually been cut down from a real example that ships with ice and doesn't quite work. There should also be a check for a second quote in there, which is where this UQ comes from. It's lower quote and upper quote, but I cut it down a bit too much to fit on screen. The main thing here is that if you don't find that, you return the status code, ice status not handled, which basically says, I haven't handled this one, someone else have a go. And the someone else in this case is the key value thing. You'll notice this time it returns an array of values as a values, and it then says, found numerical key with the following values. If the ice parser object hadn't been able to successfully pass the uh, expression, even after you decided it wasn't a string, that would be an error and it would be reported through the error handling system. You don't have to handle that manually. So here's the deck that looks like that. I have a block one with a key two, which is a string, my key, new key seven plus 12, key one is signed pi by three. Uh, so there we go, it found a text key for that one, found a numerical key, 7 plus 12 is 19, that's right. Signed pi by 3, I have no idea, but I'm pretty certain at this point I've tested enough that it's giving the right answer. Okay, so by default, an ice text deck parser object will create a maths parser for itself. You can optionally specify a pointer to an ice parser object of your own in the init method to the ice deck parser. So you can create a custom parser with all your variables, functions, etc., and those will be there and working. Um, if you use an action function that gives you a stack, uh, if you want to keep that stack, you should copy it. In Fortran, you can literally just do assignment. And in C, there's an ice copy stack function that would allow you to do that. Um, so there is a rather interesting thing that sort of came slightly emergently out of working on this thing, which is you can, there's another way that you can call that definition as well as reading it from a text file, and I could write ones for other text files, there's something uh, which is called an ice deck caller. That's something that allows you to programmatically start and end blocks and call keys from a definition. So if you combine that with your ability to bind a result function to a stack, it means you can use this deck definition to provide an external interface to your code that you can call from another language. So for example, uh, in Epoch, we're just working on implementing that. Uh, it's not a core part of this project, so it's on the, you know, not going terribly fast, but here's a few functions. So I have a, an external bind C function. This is in Epoch. This isn't part of ICE that takes the block name and it um, converts that to a Fortran block name and then uses a deck caller to start the block in uh, the same deck definition that's used by Epoch for passing its text files. You don't see it here, but this deck caller object had the definition bound to it when it was initialized. So there's that one. There's this one, which is very similar for calling the key. Uh, that takes a key in as a string, a value as a string, and optionally a value function, which is a C function of that type that you can bind to a um, to a stack and have it evaluated. And we use the deck caller call key. And then there's another function, which I'm not going to show, that matches to the start block for end block uh, that you then call when you finish a block. Um, and then you have an end deck that ends the pass. And then there's something built into the deck caller that allows you to just replay a deck as it happened now with the pass number two. Um, and that's all happens automatically. And then I just call the finalize on pass two, 
and that works. That's exactly equivalent to somebody taking an epoch deck and running it through the text parser. But you're now able to control this by calling these functions externally. You compile epoch to a shared library. I can call it from C. I can call it from Fortran. I can call it from Python. I can call it from whatever. I've turned my code with comparatively little extra work into something which I can call from outside. That isn't everything that's needed. There are some epoch internals that aren't in those simple examples that are needed in those places. There's also stuff for how do you report lines and file names for errors coming from external codes. That's all optional, but it's very useful. Um, and probably in reality, if you want your code to be controllable from Python or something, uh, you want to have uh, more control than just being able to run its input deck and just get out the answer in the old fashioned way. But it is a very strong start to allow you to mix a high performance code that can take a text file input and run on tens of thousands of processors uh, or link it to another code for doing linked multi-scale simulations or allowing you to use an interactive uh, language and run it from a Python interpreter. Okay, uh, last section before I come to conclusions, descriptions. The parser elements and the deck blocks and keys can have text descriptions associated with them when you define them. Uh, and you can retrieve those element by element, or you can get ICE2 to produce you a markdown document for either the parser or the deck information. So for example, here's a section of the documentation for Epoch's deck, listing the functions or some of the functions that are available in the Epoch deck. Uh, and that file is generated as Markdown. I've run it through Pandoc to get this, uh, but it happens pretty much automatically. You can visualize data in other ways. I can get the RPN version of the stack out, simplified or not. I can turn the simplifier on or off, although why I'd want it off, I don't know. Um, I can convert a stack back into infix maths and visualize that again, simplified or not. Given that it is a conversion back, not simply retrieving the string you gave it. Even without simplification, bracketing may change, but the expression is guaranteed to be mathematically equivalent to the one you gave it. Uh, and you can create a dot graph is dot dot file view of the stack. Those diagrams that I showed earlier in the bit on the simplifier are not something I prepared specially for this. You can get them straight out of ICE if you want to. Uh, deck has a lot of the same things. You can visualize uh, deck definitions or actual decks as dot files. It's a bit niche because most decks tend to be quite flat. You have a lot of blocks with keys in them. There's not a lot of hierarchy. A graph isn't that useful, but it can be helpful for debugging. Uh, that ice deck caller, the same mechanism that it uses to be able to um, replay the deck the second time, it can also use that to give you a epoch deck text file that you can then use uh, without having the, the library interface on it if you want. Um, and with that, I come basically to conclusions. So future work first. Uh, the most important thing that's going to happen over the none too distant future is I'm gonna finish that interoperability interface. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is to add vector execution option. As I mentioned, the speed is quite good compared with native scalar code, but Obviously, modern processes are vector. Um, so it would be quite nice to be able to take some advantage of that. Obviously, the limit is because this all relies on calling functions. You only get an improvement from vectorization if an individual getter function is complex. You can't really vectorize the um, execution of a set of function calls very easily. Um, that's potentially where the LLVM thing that I mentioned comes in, but that's a long way in the future and may make it so hard for uh, someone to put in their code that it never really sees the light of day. But it would be nice if we can add it. Um, oh, yes, I say quite tricky. Performance benefits are quite limited without requiring the host code functions to be compiled in LLVM intermediate language. Uh, and the thing that I'm still working on at the minute is more examples. There is Doxygen in about 90% of the source code. The remaining 10% was still changing recently enough that the public release doesn't have the Doxygen in because it was out of date. That last 10% will be done soon. There'll be more examples. There's a quick start guide and overview. There'll be a proper manual of all the parts uh, and that will come fairly soon. That's time scale for that sort of linked with the interoperability interface because obviously that has to be documented as well.
And finally, conclusions. ICE2 provides a fairly complete open source library for reading input files containing rich mathematical notation. It's currently fully featured for Fortran code, but it is going to have a C interface coming soon. That means other languages can interoperate with it. Um, it's a statically linked library, which has no internal communication. So it is very well suited to large scale HPC, particularly in an MPI environment. While some parts of the parser at the moment are not re-entrant, the actual evaluation of parser expressions is re-entrant and we're hoping to make more of it so. So um, it already works perfectly well in a multi-threaded environment so long as each thread has its own uh, parser object or deck object. Um, but we're hoping soon that you'll be able to use it uh, pretty much fully in a multi-threaded environment. Um, and equally, I think that it's quite an easy way of allowing you to have a code that both uh, works uh, very well uh, on a large scale HPC system with text driven input and also for allowing you to have people work with it in a user friendly environment in a single, uh, sing sort of single machine environment for interactive sessions, if that's something that your code would find useful. Uh, so that really is it. I've reached the end of what I've got to talk about. So um, if the moderators know what happens from now. <laughs> so yeah, so thanks very much um, for that, that interest, really interesting talk. I, want, I had a couple of questions. I don't anyone have any questions to start with. I'll just, my question was, so um, I've been trying to move to more modern Fortran. Um, and I, but for about the first time recently, I did sort of text parsing. Um, in in Fortran, I, I've kind of avoided that beforehand, and I find it quite tricky because of um, you know spaces on the end of strings and having to trim things all the time. Is am I using old-fashioned routines, is, or is there better support in Fortran now for string manipulation? Um, I mean, Fortran doesn't have the most sophisticated string manipulation systems that are out there. Uh, the main thing that I used for dealing with that was just allocatable strings. So I'd take the string in, I would um, do any necessary trimming, and I'd then uh, allocate a new string with the trimmed version, deallocate the original, and then use move alloc uh, to basically exchange it back into the original allocatable string. So you wind up with a permanent, you know, the permanent version you've got is a, the trimmed one. Um, it's not necessarily the fastest solution, um, but the actual tokenization stage for this isn't really the speed critical one. The evaluation is, and that doesn't involve string manipulation. Okay, because I noticed, I mean, for example, I know that the um, uh, CASTEP code has quite a comp I'm not as sophisticated as yours, but has a relatively sophisticated input system based on text. And they do all that. Again, I was surprised to find they do their string, they do all their input and stuff in Fortran. Um, and I should maybe look at what they, uh, way they do as well, because that seems to work quite well. But it was just the fact that yeah, Fortran strings are nice in the sense they know how long they are. But on the other hand, that is how long they, that's their maximum length, isn't it? Including trading spaces. And that's slightly counterintuitive yeah. if you're coming from a C background. Um, it is. It is. I mean, um, the fact that there isn't any sort of, e I mean, you can, you can, you can happily put in a null and, you know, write routines of your own that use nulls to indicate ends and things. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's true, you know, there's, there's certainly no equivalent to the lovely trick of in C of, you know, you just take it and everywhere there's a space, you switch it for a null and yeah. put in a new pointer and there you've split your space, your, your string up. You can't do that. It is a pity. So do you use character strings or arrays of characters? Is that what you find um, I, I am actually using allocatable character strings mostly. So uh, not, not, not allocatable character arrays, actually allocatable character strings. Yeah, allocatable okay. character strings. So one where you do allocate character len equals so-and-so, colon, colon, name. Right. Okay. Um, there are use of the other sort because obviously those are the uh, the ones that are interoperable with C. Yes. So that, that was my so that was the my other question was how does string interoperability work with C and that's through arrays of characters. That's the way to do it, is it? Yep, that is the way. Um, there there are actually uh, I mean if you have a look at I, one of the things I forgot to put on these slides actually I'll uh, I'll just get it but. Um, 
Yeah, that was the thing. The KS has just asked, how do you get the code? That's the one thing I, I completely forgot to put on the slide. I found it with a Google. I've actually have it up here. I was having a quick poke around, look around while you were talking. Yeah. So, so yeah, I will just paste in the chat. There is the thing. Uh, there is the, the GitHub link. It's um, completely open. It's github.com slash csbrady hyphen warwick slash eis hyphen two. So, so that's, that's where you get it from. And in there, there are a couple of functions in common source uh, ice utils. There's ice cf string and ice fc string, which do the conversion back and forth between Fortran and C strings. Um, and that's both from um, interoperable C pointers, you know, type C pointer and from... Uh, um, from just arrays of characters, but ultimately it has to be arrays of characters behind the scene, even if it's um, a C pointer to an array of characters. That's that is how you have to do it. And you stick nulls in by hand, do you, for, for, the, for the benefit of C? Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, and what are the features of Fortran 2000 and was it 2008? You said 2003 you, I mean, is the core. The, so I, I'm never very good at what's got what. That's that's fully. Oh, oh, yes, 2003 in, 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 in yep. orientation, did it? Yeah. It is, yeah. Fortran 2003 added object orientation, which was not crucial here, but made it a lot nicer. The other key thing uh, was function pointers. The uh, older, because um, while you could you know, have an interface in a function before that, where you could pass in a function, you couldn't store one and call it later, which obviously this uses very heavily. Um, so the older version of this in Fortran 95 that Epoch had actually just had giant case statements. Every token had an associated numerical value and it would then just go through this huge list of cases going, you know, okay. case this numerical value, do this. Uh, that's one of the reasons why this, this code is substantially fast. I mean, the, even the old one was faster than Python just because it's um, much, much less general purpose. It doesn't try to do as much, uh, but this one is solidly 20% faster for most things and has a better simplifier as well, but that's a different point. Because I thought you were going to say is you were going that is that in the old version you stored the function pointer in, a, in a, an integer and just tried to hoodwink the compiler at runtime. So it would actually, <laughs> I mean, I've done that kind of thing in the old days, but I've done it as well. But one of the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the things with Epoch was it was we knew it was going to go. Well, we didn't know. We hoped it was going to go um, all over the place, and I can make that work for any given compiler. I wouldn't want to say I could make it work for someone running on a blue gene. Yeah. Say. But my final question sorry, is that I mean, you're using quite sophisticated features of Fortran. Uh, maybe you missed it, but how portable is it between different Fortran compilers? Have you had problems with that? Okay, so the answer is it's very portable between uh, pretty much all modern Fortran compilers. Uh -huh. uh, basically, I use the, there's a very useful feature on the Fortran wiki, which is a sort of matrix of what features different compilers support. Uh, so I basically used that and didn't touch anything that at least the Cray, Intel, G Fortran, Portland group, and NAG compilers didn't support. Right. So I've not tested it on NAG. That's the, the one of those I, I just haven't had access to, uh, but I see no reason to believe it wouldn't work. Um, but basically, it's a case of if you're working with a relatively modern version of any of those compilers, you'll have absolutely no problem. If you're still working with, you know, G Fortran 4.3, which is surprisingly common, um, you're going to have a few more problems. And the problem I have when I'm more than I was not, I and mean, you, you're, 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 um, program is standalone, so you didn't suffer from this. But but wasn't the modern Fortran feature was the fact that the older libraries purported to have modern interfaces, but they were often broken. Like like you know there were even simple things didn't work. And clearly people hadn't used them before. But it, I was quite surprised that quite simple test and this was interfaced to MPI in particular. Quite simple test codes would fail because the interface was clearly just wrong. Um, yeah, it but, does um, happen. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that at the moment ICE kind of doesn't have that I, I uh, as part of the sort of documentation thing that the next bit going forward is uh, deployment tests. So you can just put it on your system and just go test, do this test and it'll check and make sure that it compiles and runs and does something uh, sensible. At the moment, we don't have those. 
Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it is surprising how many things didn't quite work. I mean, partly because these new interfaces do have all sorts of um, weird odds and ends. I mean, one of the one of the reasons that we do both 2003 and 2008 is that in 2008 you can finally pass. Uh, you can have a target variable outside that you pass to a function that has the target parameter on the dummy argument and have that target be guaranteed to be the actual target so that you can safely store that variable without it having to be a pointer. Um, but that's actually quite restrictive and it, if you actually use it, it's remarkably easy for someone to pass a non-target variable and the thing compiles and it runs and 99 times out of 100 that'll work and it'll run, but the 100th time the compiler will have done something unexpected and it just crashes. Fortran has, I really like it, it's a wonderful language, but it does have some horrible dark edge cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so I didn't have any more questions, that was very interesting. Um, so if there's no more questions, I'd just like to thank everyone, I'd just like to thank Chris for giving me such an interesting talk and um, bringing the entire Archer one training program to an end. Um, so, um, and the Archer website, which is where these materials stored, will be up for, it will be made static at some point in the future, but it's going to be up for a long time. And I'd like to thank you again, Chris. And um, thank you for inviting me. If that's everything, um, um, goodbye. And thanks for all the fish, I guess, is what you're supposed to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Bye, everyone. Bye.